It was about late November in Colorado. I was about seven or eight. My father got the idea of taking all of us for a weekend to a cabin that he was gonna rent. My mother thought it was a great idea for me, my sister and father and mother to bond. So this is exactly what happened. We took off school on Friday to get a head start there. I had no issue with that. When we get there, it was cold as hell. Well, it's almost December, so I guess it made sense that it was so cold. Anyway, we got all set up and decided where we'd all sleep. We ate dinner and then we got all our stuff set up for bed and we were talking about what we were going to do tomorrow. We got there kind of late and we couldn't do that much on the first night. Later on though, I heard some noises outside. It sounded like footsteps. I looked out of the window and saw nothing, so I figured it must have been an animal. I tried to go back to sleep, then about 15 minutes later again, I heard it. I woke my sister up. She was about 11 at the time and she heard it as well. We both walked over to the window and saw something. We weren't quite sure what it was. We decided that it was going to be best if whatever it was didn't see us, so we decided to go back to sleep. I had a hard time sleeping that night, so did my sister, but when we eventually woke up, my mother was inside making breakfast and my father was outside. I asked my mum if we could go outside with dad, and she told me sure, while my sister and I stayed inside and waited for my mother to finish breakfast. I walked outside and my father was talking to some man, a short chubby guy. He had a shaved head and was wearing a veteran cap. He looked really nervous too. I mean for no reason, he was sweating a lot, even though it was freezing out. I walked over to him and my father. My father looked at me and said, oh, this is my son. He then told the guy my name. The man looked at me and said, nice to meet you. I'm John. He smiled and looked at me. I smiled and greeted back and it may have been rude at the time, but I was a kid and I said to him, you look kind of scared. You okay? He then replied, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I went through some shell shock. I'm a veteran. He said, as I couldn't tell already with the cap he was wearing. He seemed normal then. My dad seemed to really like this guy, and I liked that too. He told my father he also rented a cabin with his family, and that they were really close to us, so he decided to introduce himself. My father invited him inside for breakfast, and he stayed. It was normal. I then went outside to play after that with my father and Patrick. While outside, I fell and hurt my knee and started crying. Now my dad was inside at the time, a bad time for him to be inside. My mother was calling for him and he ran outside where I was with Patrick. Patrick ran over to me and told me to come with him to his cabin because he had band-aids. I agreed because I wasn't very smart at the time. I went with Patrick. We talked about what I liked doing and I told him I liked playing video games and stuff like that. Then he got weird. He asked me what shoe size I was and I told him. I didn't actually know it at the time so I had to guess. He then asked how old I was and I said. He kind of chuckled along the lines of, good to know. Also, his cabin was nowhere near as. It was way back. It took 20-25 minutes to walk there. I was tired and there was no point in getting the band-aid anymore. We had walked so far now that I decided just to keep going. We entered the cabin. He then told me to go in first. I did. As soon as I walked in, I realised something was wrong. There was nobody there, no family. I asked him where his family was. He didn't answer, pretending he didn't hear me. He locked the door. I then got kind of frightened. He said, I'll be right back with the band-aid. Just wait here. He walked into the kitchen and pulled one out of somewhere and then walked back to me and told me to have a seat while he put it on. I sat down and he put it on me. He also held my leg with his other hand and started rubbing it saying, you're rather muscular, I like that. I got kind of scared and immediately stood up. He asked me what was wrong and I said that my leg was feeling way better. I then thought my parents must be worried sick about me and told him this. He insisted that I stayed more and I ate. I didn't want to, but I was alone and if I ran, I wouldn't have really known where to go. 
The door was locked too, so I just agreed to eat with him and get it over with quick. He asked how much I weighed, I guess around 73 pounds. Then he had a smile across his face. He nodded and said perfect. I asked him what he meant and he just kept smiling. I was really weirded out by this. I said could I go? He told me no, that things were just getting started and I shouldn't miss out on the fun. He had a really funny tone. I then heard a big bang come from the bathroom. It was a closed door. I was really worried now. Patrick stood up and looked angry. He walked into the room and shut the door behind him. I then heard him yelling, Did I tell you to move? Did I say you could move an inch? No, then stay where you are, I have company. Or something like that. He then walked out with a smile on his face and shut the door slowly. Sorry about that, it's my wife. She's really sick and not allowed anywhere near visitors today. He was smiling while saying that. I really wanted to go. I then looked around the room and noticed that there were clothes everywhere. It was a mess. He must have been living out of here. At that moment, his wife walked out of the room. I'm hungry, she said. He looked furious. Get back in there, he said. His wife was extremely pale and had obviously been crying a lot. She sniffed a bit and had red lines under her eyes. She looked to me, then walked back into the room. I asked him where his kids were and he didn't answer me. He told me that he had kids clothes that he wanted me to try on. This was the last straw. I knew I had to get out of that situation, but I didn't know how. I started crying. He then hugged me, saying, It'll be alright little one, nothing's gonna happen, just try these on. He then walked into the back room. I thought this was the perfect time for me to leave. I unlocked his door and tried to leave as quietly as I could. I didn't care if I got lost anymore. I wasn't going to take the chances with this John, if that was even his real name. I had a feeling that he had been lying to me. He lied about having kids, so who knows what else he lied about. I was in the woods now trying to find my way back. I was still close to his home. I could hear shouting. I could hear him yelling at his wife saying, Where the hell did he go? I told you not to let him leave. You probably let him out. I could have sworn that I heard him call us some profanities too. Then it happened. I stopped dead in my tracks. I heard footsteps. I went and hid behind a tree and looked in his direction. He was outside. He seemed to be mad looking for me. I was far enough away where I could barely see him but he was obviously out there trying to find me. He then stepped out into the forest and said, Hey kid, it's alright, you can come back now. You don't have to try the clothes on. I have toys here. All you gotta do is come back. I lost it. I ran as fast as I could in a straight line in the hopes of finding somebody in my family. I was running away and I thought I could hear him shouting but I didn't stop long enough to hear it. Then, after about an hour of running, I saw a cabin. Mine. My father was outside looking around, looking for me. I ran up to him crying and told him that this John wasn't a good guy and how weird he was touching me. My father immediately called the person he rented the cabin from and he said that nobody had rented that cabin. My father looked to me and told me never to follow a stranger again, but he immediately left that day. I got asked a ton of questions the next day. The guy renting out the cabins apologised. The man having the cabin rentals called the police and the police checked the cabin and they found nobody there, not even his wife. His clothes and all his belongings were still there, that's what they told us. I never really heard much else after that. John is more than likely not his real name, he probably wasn't a vet. I just want to know what happened to his wife and him, how he even got there in the first place and why he lied about being in that cabin. He seemed to have lived there for a while. I guess he left because he figured the police would be coming soon. So many questions that I'm never going to answer. I'm just glad that it's all over. I hope to never see him again. This is not my own story, but one that is told to me by a friend who lives near Tusman, AZ. Apparently, he and his friends were out in the desert one night. I can't remember if they were camping overnight or just out late, when they kind of got separated. There were three of them, 
and the one I know, I'll just call him Joe, though that's not his actual name, was calling for the other two when he spies somebody who was crouching near the ground nearby and they suddenly stand up in the moonlight. This was around 8 yards away from him. He pulls it as one of his friends and starts to move towards it. As he does so, he begins to hear his actual buddies in the distance and they call from behind him. He just very slowly backs away from it and ran. He thinks it is possibly a skinwalker, but it is probably one of those weirdos who like to go out alone in the desert. I don't really blame him for running though, I'd be freaked out too. I did a 65 day expedition through the Absorka mountain range in Wyoming. We were legit in the middle of nowhere, the furthest point from a road in the lower 48. About 30 days in, we camped near a creek with sandy banks. We get this idea in our head to make a sauna, so we all use the tent poles from all around the five tents, throw all the tent flies over the dome and pile sand all around us and at the bottom to keep the heat in. We dig a hole in the middle and started dragging rocks from where we'd thrown them in the campfire earlier so we all climb in, all 12 of us, and we poured water over the hot rocks in the hole. And presto, it's an instant sauna. Somebody comments that, considering how dirty we all are after being out for a month, we should jump in the creek. Somebody else points out that dirt, because it's abrasive, clean skin, and the cold creek will make our pores close immediately, and we're going to be cleaner than we've been in an entire month. Everybody agrees, we promptly cover ourselves in dirt, scrubbing it in. So we all get up, haul us out of the tent, and jump in the freezing creek, screaming all the way. It turns out that, while we're in there, a horse camp had set up on the opposite side of the creek. So we all jump out and haul us back to the sauna. Now you can imagine if you were those horse guys. You're weeks into the middle of nowhere on horseback. You actually run into another camp, which is weird by itself. Maybe an hour later, 12 people run naked and muddy from the creek screaming and jumping into an unknown place. This happened about 22 years ago when I was 11. My parents bought a home in a rather rural area. I'd always been around nature, so I didn't mind the change. I just wished that there were more kids my age there. I spent a lot of time with my parents or helping the elderly neighbours. I was homeschooled and very awkward. My mother did not believe in busy homework. If I knew the subject, my mum would reward me with time off. I was to play for at least 3 hours a day. So I took to walking around the area, pretending I was an explorer. I got to know a lot of the workers and they sometimes brought me fruit and trees. Unfortunately, I was the only person for under 18 miles. My sister had moved out and after her graduation, she rarely called. We had never been so close, but we barely kept any tabs on one another. Back then it would have been impossible to make her care about anything other than her own life. The town was trying everything it could to bring young families in. It prospered years later, with its own school and activity buildings, but back then, it was half developed, there was a few houses, and half-hearted attempts at a park. The area was flanked by forests on one side and farmland on the other. To keep me occupied, my father come home with a dog. He thought it would be good protection for me and teach me responsibility. Instead of the cute, fluffy Yorkie I begged for, he got an old German Shepherd named Art. He was slightly overweight and only had one eye. I fell in love with him instantly. He belonged to my father's old war buddy, a former police officer who trained security dogs for a living. He was moved into the city and could not take Art with him. He was like all the other animals we had. Slightly used, but well loved. Everybody in the family really liked him, but Art took to me instantly. I was his new mission, I couldn't leave the room without him following. When I used the bathroom, he would press his nose to the door and thumb up against a hard wood floor. He insisted on sleeping with me. When people approached, he stood in front of me and wouldn't let them go by it unless I gave him a pat on the head and a good word. The best part was a series of commands that I had written on a small sheet of paper. Art could sit, 
Roll over, shake hands, play dead, look ashamed, guard and protect. I had never uttered the order because my father said it could be dangerous. The rest were just fun though. I was always cheerful with art. He was 10 years old and starting to slow down, my dad said, but he could walk long distances and listen to secrets, so there was no need for a wild crazy puppy. I loved art with all the passion of a kid. He was my best friend, and to this day I speak about him like he was some sort of cousin or brother. I guess in some ways he was. So during one September, Art and I were walking on the edge of the forest, near the newly cut cultivated lots. I was two blocks from any homes. I was asking Art what we should do when he laid down on the grass and rolled over. I sat down too, annoyed when the grass started to soak my jeans, but I was tired from running through the park and it felt so good just to relax. About 30 minutes passed by it and I was cold, tired and hungry. Dinner would be soon and the forest was starting to look ominous. I was getting to my feet when I heard the sound of boats on the ground. I didn't think anything of it at first. It sounded familiar. They were boats on gravel. I turned to face a rather plainly dressed man. He wore a black windbreaker dirty jeans and thick worker boots. His face was covered in rough beard and he looked like he had just come from a hard day's work under the hot sun. At first, I thought he was one of the surveyors coming to look at the land. I had gotten yelled at before for walking on private property, for there were no signs here and it was open, so I didn't think this was one of the choice spots for the building. He also, as I noticed, didn't have any of the usual tools or gear no book to write anything down in. When I looked him face to face, he had an intense look, like he'd just done a riddle that he could not solve. I knew something was wrong when Art sat down in front of me. The guy stopped, held his hands up. Does that thing bite? He does. He used to be a cop dog. And at that moment, my friendly dog turned very dangerous. He was a very serious threat, at least to the guy in front of me. Ah. Oh. I need to go now, I said. It was the truth, but I wanted to go because I was getting worried. I just want to talk to you, the man said. I have to go home, my mom's waiting for me, I said. The guy then come closer, one step at a time. I backed away. I was all of 80 pounds and he was closer to 250 pounds. Luckily, Art weighed in at close to 100 pounds, making it easier for me to remain calm. I was wondering if you could point me in the direction of South Street, the guy said, in his tone even. Turn that way, I said pointing. He looked, nodded, and turned around. The tension drained from me, and I started to walk away. The second my back was turned, the man grabbed my shoulders and tried to drag me into the woods. I screamed. I fouled, Art lunged and latched onto the man's ankle. The man dropped me, kicking at Art with his boots. I took off running towards our neighbour's home. The man who lived there had watched me a few times and my parents knew him. I called him Grandpa Pat. I could hear the man screaming and the sound of cloth ripping. I made it into Grandpa Pat's yard and burst into his home. He was not there, but his granddaughter Lily was. Despite being 28, she listened to me like I was an adult. She quickly called the cops and my parents, and then her granddad. Art turned up in the yard 10 minutes later, with some jeans stuck in his teeth. He had a few lacerations where the guy punched him, but he was no worse for wear. Now I don't know what would have happened to me had my dad brought me a Yorkie instead of a former police dog. The man was caught a few weeks later trying to climb in the window to get a three-year-old who lived in my neighbor's house. I'm just blessed that my dad got me a nice big German Shepherd. I used to do wilderness forestry in the Linville, Georgia area of Northern Carolina. A jack-o'-lantern is a disembodied light that floats in the air. They are commonly reported in the Southern Appalachians but reports are usually disregarded because it's easy to imagine that the person seeing them was just seeing something more mundane. I've seen a few things that I suspect were jack-o'-lanterns, but there was one that was plain and clearly just a floating light out in the open in the east side of the Shortoff mountain, 
and there's no trails in place there, so it can only be accessed by somebody with very good mountaineering skills and woodcraft. Furthermore, it was floating above the brush, way too thick for anything to move through, especially not as quickly and as smoothly as this did. I should point out that there is a confirmed similar phenomenon nearby, the brown mountain lights. That has puzzled people for centuries. On hot summer nights, you can sit at the Wiseman's View or a pull off on the highway east of George and see jack-o'-lanterns dancing across the sky. I worked at a hotshot crew for the first time for the forest service, so we spent two or three weeks out in remote areas. We covered a large amount of ground on foot, generally nowhere near the trails or by common traffic. We'd found weird stuff before, like sashes of guns, creepy old trapping cabins in AK. I mean picture a cabin in a horror movie with rusty traps everywhere. And we even shot a bear once because it's way too interested in our spike camp. Now we took bear matters very, very seriously. That was after a crew member was attacked by a bear in 2008 while performing a burnout operation. Well, one day my buddy Greg and his saw partner were following the fire, cut in line, when suddenly, Greg noticed a pair of car hearts half buried in the ground. Oh, car hearts, said Greg with some enthusiasm. Greg's saw partner knew something must be up, as he noticed that Greg pulled out his chew and flicked it on the ground. Greg always saved his chew for the last two cycles of consumption, and his partner gave him that chew just an hour before. Now as Greg picked up the incredibly heavy pants, they still had legs, and part of the vertebrae inside them. The upper half of the body was totally missing. Turns out some poor guy got him torn apart by a bear. They found the rest of his body about a quarter of a mile away. It must have happened years ago because all they found were bones. It happened in the early 2000s when I was 14. In my country of Norway, there's not that many gated communities. It's a small wealthy country with a low crime rate. Even so, me and my family lived in sort of a gated community. It was located on top of a hill surrounded by large areas of forests. There were barriers on all sides making it impossible to reach the inside of my community by car unless you had a key to one of the barriers. There was only one road connecting the community to the outside world. My mum said it reminded her of this book she read when she was younger about a village on top of a mountain where the everybody died after the road connecting the village was broken. But mostly everybody felt completely safe here. So one night I was heading to my friend Tamar's house to watch a movie. She lived on the other side of the neighbourhood by the edge of the forest. But it just took a couple of minutes walking, and since everybody felt so safe inside the gated community, my parents would let me visit my friends quite late on the weekends. So it was a night during fall, and it was completely dark. There was absolutely nobody outside. The only thing I could hear were my own footsteps on the pavement. I walked past a couple of rows of houses and a little park and come to a football field. The lights on the football field were closed for the night, so Again, it is pitch black, but crossing it was the quickest way to find my friend. I opened my cell phone for lights and kept walking. When I reached the middle of the football field, something happened that made my heart jump. On the other side of the field, in a small patch of forest, is a bright light. I turned my head and found a car's spotlights pointing at me. I freaked out, but I didn't really have a choice but to continue walking as I was in the middle. The car kind of stood there as if somebody was inspecting me from far away. Something about it felt really wrong. The whole area inside the community was a no car zone and there would hardly ever be a car inside. You would have had to go through a lot of trouble to get a car all the way inside the football field. Whoever was inside clearly had a reason for hiding their car inside the forest with full view of the field. Almost as if they were waiting for somebody to pass by at night. The car started moving a little. From the corner of my eye, I saw it slowly creeping out from behind the forest to me, as if they were trying not to be noticed they were getting closer. That's when I started running. 
Whoever was inside hit the gas and the car that was previously creeping up on me was now coming at me full speed. The car had caught up to me within seconds and it turned onto the small side of the road with a sharp turn and it almost crashed. Whoever was inside really wanted to get to me. There were no houses nearby, only trees on the other side of the road. I kept running in the darkness on this small road only thinking that if I screamed, nobody's gonna hear me. I had to do something or whoever was in this car would get me. And at the rate I was going, that was about to happen. My only advantage and what saved my life was that I knew the area like the back of my hand. There was a very narrow path way too narrow for a car going uphill between trees on the left side of the road just a couple of meters ahead. I turned left and ran up the narrow path. I prayed that the car would keep going and lose me. The car suddenly stopped with a scream of the tires. By now I was running on sheer adrenaline impelled by my fear of whoever was behind me. I was worried that the muscles in my thighs would rip, but I had to keep going. I didn't have a choice. I managed to turn my head slightly while running and saw two men with knives in their hands getting out of the car. Somebody yelled, get her. It was too dark to see their faces. I actually think they might have worn ballys, but I couldn't see that well. I know that they're all in black and it's very difficult to see them in the dark. One thing's for certain, these were big guys. Their voices giving themselves away as probably in their mid twenties to late thirties. I didn't have the time or energy to turn my head again but I was sure that this was the first time that I'd got a clear glance of them, and I could see also that somebody was left in the car. That could only mean one thing. The men running behind me were planning on bringing me back to the car and to that last person. Oh my god. I kept screaming. Someone's actually trying to kidnap me. If these guys were going to get me, I'll never see the sun again. I thought to myself. It was honestly the most horrific hour of my life. Just minutes ago I'd been walking to my friend's house on a normal weekend night and now I was running for my life with these monsters with knives behind me. I sprinted towards the first house. I saw them getting out of the forest patch. I managed to get to the door of the house which was open by some miracle. I sprinted inside, slid down on the floor catching my breath and asking myself what the hell happened. I looked outside. I didn't see anyone. My friend's home was just two houses down from the one I was in. I was worried that whoever was in the home would think I was a maniac. In a moment of sheer and stupid panic, I opened the door, rang the doorbell to the house as hard as I could so whoever lived in there would come to the door. By the time I managed to catch my breath explain to the people what had happened, my dad had come to pick me up. There was no one to be found in the whole community. No car, no people, nothing. The only thing they left behind was a mark on the road where the car turned so fast from earlier. The mark stayed there for weeks. I still get shivers when I pass that spot even 10 years later. When we were little, my father who was in the army for 18 years used to tell us true stories about him and his fellow comrades. One of them happened in East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. One time, my father and his friends were in a camp on duty in the middle of nowhere when they suddenly hear a woman's voice outside of their camp. My father and his friends were scared and they weren't sure what to do because the nearest town was at least 50 kilometers away. Anyway, they went outside and asked the lady if everything was alright. She said she was lost and that she needed food and water. My father invited her inside and gave her some food and water. After she finished the food, she asked my dad if he was local. My dad told her that he's from West Pakistan and he's only there for training. She then asked my dad if he'd like some homemade sweets. He said yes to this and she left. A couple of days went by and my father forgot about the incident. A few days later, when my father and his friends were sleeping in the tent, they heard the same woman's voice again, this time in different clothes and new perfume. Her hair was new and looked wet like she just had a shower and got ready. It never looked like she had gone 50 miles to get there. My father invited her inside again and got her some water. This time she refused the water and gave my father a tray with a piece of cloth on it. 
When my father took the cloth, he said there were homemade sweets, as she promised. The sweets were still warm, like somebody had just made them. After a while, the woman left again and promised to come back soon. According to my father, she started to come in there every single day with the same sweets. One day, she asked my father and his friends if they were married. My father lied to her and told her that he was happily married, but my father's friend told her that he is not. She then asked if he would like to marry her, and he told her no, in which she got angry and told them they were just wasting her time and they would regret it. After that, she never come back. Now after a few days, my father and his friends finished their training and left camp. When they reached the nearest town, they asked the locals about the woman. The locals told them that nobody with that name and description lived in town. The nearest town after that was a few hundred miles away. After that, my father left the area to come home to Pakistan. To this day, my father is wondering about the woman and wants to know who she was or where she was coming from. My dad and I are avid campers. Not professionals anymore, but my dad used to be a wilderness guide for kids. We typically prefer the eastern and western Sierras as they have great car camping spots next to the lake and lots of great trails. So last summer, we decided to go up for a two night stay and do some day hiking. The campground was pretty full, not unusual for the summer, but we were lucky enough, so I thought at the time, to find a pretty secluded site and we set up our tents there. For the first night everything was normal, a little later there was bear activity, but we're used to that. Second night, I crawled into my sleeping bag in my tent, and I pass out cold. Eventually at 3am, I'm awoken to the sound of footsteps. My dad is diabetic and needs to pee around 3 or 4 times a night, and the sounds are definitely footprints but they're coming from the wrong direction. We were located next to the bathrooms. So the footsteps should have been moving in that direction, but instead, they're coming closer and closer to our tent. They then stop about a yard short, the breathing gets really heavy. I first rush it off as my dad, maybe he lost his flashlight. The breathing suddenly goes away. I fall back to sleep, only to be awoken a few minutes later to breathe in right above my tent now. Now you know that rush of terror that goes up your spine? I had that. This wasn't my dad. I lay perfectly still, but the footprints continued to circle around the tent. I had the rain fly on so I couldn't see through the roof, and it was a new moon, and it was pitch black. Now I convinced myself, a heavy sleeper that I'm just dreaming. Just as I'm thinking that, I now feel a single finger run through the length of my foot through the tent. Real slow, and really eerie. Now I figured that I must have been dreaming because my foot is in the sleeping bag, it couldn't possibly be that. But that comfort quickly disappeared. I used a small ambient light available that my foot was bare and out of the bag. I laid there froze, as whatever it was stroked my foot for maybe two minutes now. It gave a few more laborious breaths and then just stood above my tent for what felt like an eternity before disappearing. I ended up staying up all night. I was really harrowed by this. In the morning, I heard my dad get out of his tent. I bolted up and met him by the fire. He looked me in the eyes and asked me if I got gotten up in the night before. I asked him the same thing, and he said that he had been around at 2am because he thought somebody was going for our stuff. I told him my story. We noticed our gear had recently been rambled through, and it was rearranged on the table. Every item was there, nothing taken, just touched. The footprints were in a perfect circle around my tent too. Now we still can't even talk about this without getting scared. A few years back in early fall, my dad and I were breaking down a guiding camp on the upper copper river behind Hudson Bay Mountain when we heard a commotion coming from behind the bush. We're in the middle of nowhere, there's no other humans for at least 40 kilometers, and we were hearing this unearthly shrieking sound. We run out into the forest, 
heading downhill to the lowlands next to the river, and we watch as maybe a group of six or seven wolves chase down a bull moose. The animal had a massive gash in its side. It had been gored at, and another predator was now following him from the rear. It's a full-grown male bear. It's a grizzly bear. I thought I was watching a movie, like one of those things you only see in nature documentaries. We followed from a distance of maybe 250 meters. While the bull moose desperately tried to cross the river, it never made it. The wolves descended on their prey, dagging at it on the shore while it was kicking and shrieking in agony. The wolves didn't get their prize for long as the grizzly was done watching and charged at the wolves, which broke them up, then they attacked. The massive bear broke two of the pack against the ground, and the other animals slicked back into the woods. They didn't go far from the kill though, knowing that the bear wouldn't be able to eat all of it on its own. It was a battle that you only hear about from the First Nations. That was the moment I realised why we're not the top of the food chain. My dad and I decided that we had to make our move. As we started moving, the grizzly began watching us from across the river. Now I've never been so scared in my life, or so awestruck. I now have a very good respect for nature, and I'm thankful for that. Me and my dad went camping in Savage Gulf in Tien during my senior year of high school. We didn't bring a tent because it wasn't supposed to be that cold, seeing as it is only the beginning of fall. Despite this, I didn't sleep at all that night because I was so cold. It was a long and miserable night. We are staying in our sleeping bags on a top. I don't know what time it was, but the moon had already reached its peak in the sky, and darkness of the night had changed from pitch black to slightly less black. I still couldn't see much. By this time, I'd heard some leaves rustling and something moving in the underbrush. I gauged it as about 20 feet away. Just where our campsite was meeting the thick woods. I then heard it again about 30 minutes later, but it was hard to tell but something was definitely there. We're in Tennessee, and after living and camping there my whole life, I wasn't too worried that it could be a bear, I assumed it as a raccoon, or a possum. As soon as dawn broke, and I was able to see again, I jumped out of my sleeping bag to make a fire, because I was still freezing. After I warmed up a bit, I go over to where I thought the sounds were to figure out what was going on. I then found cat tracks, I mean big cat tracks, poor prints bigger than my hand. They were too big for a lynx or bobcat, and we then hiked back to the ranger station and asked him if it could possibly be a mountain lion in Tien. The ranger was doubtful until I showed him the pictures I took of the tracks next to my hand. So apparently, we had just slept as human burritos 20 feet away from a fucking mountain lion. So I must have been about 9 when this happened. My mum was a single mum, and I had a much older brother who lived away from home. We basically lived in the middle of nowhere, just the two of us. Our closest neighbour was within 15 minutes running distance, but certainly not shouting distance. We had an old main road which ran past our home. We would maybe have two or three cars passing our home in the evening. Those who were heading into our local town or trying to avoid the main road. So basically no one. Our nights were always quiet. It was a kind of place where if there was a knock on the door, your blood ran cold. Usually it'd be somebody who was lost or somebody who had a car crash. The winding roads here could be very awkward to navigate, and for some reason, we had no curtains. And we had these big huge windows along both walls of our living room. It would creep me out a bit when I was alone, but when my mum was there, I felt a riot. So this one Friday night, I'm sat with my mum watching a movie in our PJs with our dog. Our weekend tradition. It was dark and must have been late. And the knock at the door happens. We both do a double take and look at each other and freak out a little bit. But then my mum does her parenting and acts very calm. She heads to the door with me following close behind, hiding behind the fridge. Undoes all the locks on the door and opens it. No one's there. 
My mum instantly slams the door and starts panicking silently. She gives me some weak explanation about a deer running in our door. I obviously don't believe it, but I don't want to argue. She seemed to convince herself that everything was alright and she takes me off to bed. So Saturday night comes. Being a child, I'd forgotten about the night before and I think my mum would convince herself that it didn't happen. I don't think it's hard to work out what happened next. The knock again. Obviously I instantly remember the night before and a chill runs through me. I don't know if any of you have ever seen parents looking scared but there's nothing more terrifying when you're a kid. My mum obviously tries to act normal. We make our way to the front door. I'm again hiding and there's no one there. My mum slams the door shut. This time, it's really freaking out both of us. Like I said, our living room has big windows on either side of it. Now our living room was also at the centre of our home and the only phone was in front of one of the big windows. The thought of walking in that room and whoever it was on the other side watching us go to the phone was beyond creepy. We sat in the kitchen for a bit after scrambling to close the kitchen blinds. Normally we'd never bother closing this because we only had forests around us so there was good privacy from it. Now eventually my mum had to do something. She tells me that it's probably kids. Even as a child, I know this isn't true, she heads away to call the cops. Eventually the police turn up, they do a walk around the property and they find nothing and give us a number to call if it happens again. Then. The same thing happens the next three nights in a row, the police come every time, but as we're really in the middle of nowhere, it takes them a while to get there and people have lots of places to hide. Obviously my mum's terrified at this point, living alone with just your young daughter in the home, can you imagine how scary that would be? So the police agreed to do a stakeout on our home that night. We had a little country path which runs off the main road and along the front of our home, so they set up there. At the time I was both afraid and excited. So on their stakeout, the police observe a guy turn off his lights in his engine a few feet up the road from our home and roll into the side of the front of our house. This has a perfect view of our living room. He sat there for two hours watching our home before getting out and sneaking up to the front door. This is when the police quickly arrest him. So there's some creepy man who lived several towns away, at least 20 miles or so, who would come just to watch my mum at night and freak her out by knocking on the door. Just thinking about him watching us that week, or how long he'd been watching us before he started knocking, it's so creepy. I really can't stand the thought of this. I'm a former Philmont ranger here. For those of you who don't know Philmont, it is a Boy Scouts 138,000 acre high adventure base in nowhere, New Mexico. On a day off, two fellow rangers and myself decided to bag 12 peaks in a 24 hour hike. The planned route was almost 50 miles and we had to reposition water and snacks at one point due to the lack of water in the area that was close to the campers. So we set off and the hike was going great. Fast forward to about 2.30am, 18 hours into the hike, we were just getting off the black mountain and finished a 2000 feet descent which was wicked steep and all screen which is loose rocks. We have two headlamps between us since mine had burnt out about an hour ago. We walk out along this ridge with a few feet of trees on either side before it drops off. After about half a mile, my friend notices a big pair of glowing eyes just behind us. It's a mountain lion, no doubt about it. It is about this time that we've realised that, early in the morning, we're going to look like food to them. We decided to make a lot of noise and just keep walking down the trail. We only make it a few feet before we see a different set of eyes to our right. Another mountain lion. We think, that's weird, they never hunt together. Now we grab our pocket knives, we have one in each hand and a rock in the other, convinced that they're about to attack us. We walk a little further down and a third pair of eyes pops up on our left. We're now fucked. One of my buddies then quickly picks up a rock, chucks it to our left. After two tries, he nails it on the head. And it lets out the most terrifying, 
blood curdling scream that you ever hear in your life, but none of the three mountain lions leave. Again, this is strange because animals normally flee when they're hurt unless they're sick, starving or protecting their young. We decided to make noise, we now decide upon a song to sing and eventually somehow settled on Call Me Maybe and proceed to felt that out to the mountain lions. No dice. We're walking in a triangle formation, all facing outwards so nobody's back is exposed. After the longest two miles of my life, we eventually come out into a clearing where we found a camp. We went to the cabin and collapsed on the porch and took a quick 20 minute power nap before continuing the hike and finishing at 23 hours 57 minutes and 30 seconds. It turns out that that proportion of the park had been closed because of mountain lion breathing. Apparently, we stumbled upon parents teaching their cubs to hunt. When I was younger, I lived pretty deep out in the country. Now where I lived was notorious for having lots of weirdos and creeps who took advantage of the vast open space and forested area to do weird stuff. And I nearly fell victim to this. So often me and my friends would go out and explore the forest just to pass time. We would play all kinds of games here. Hide and seek, tag, manhunt, you name it, we done it. There was this one evening in particular that we were playing manhunt. If you don't know how to play it, you have to go back to the base and not get caught while doing so. I had gone pretty far out this time, I really didn't want to get caught. My friends were out looking for me, one by one I could hear them getting caught out. I was desperate not to get caught, I had a sick hiding place under a tree. I was covered by leaves, I waited in this spot for what felt like an eternity. It started getting dark too, my friends really weren't going to find me. I could see the moon coming up and I realised it was about time I went back. Just as I was about to break my cover, I could see some torches in the distance and what appeared to be hooded figures. I knew this wasn't right. I began walking back slowly and I heard somebody shout out for me, followed by laughing. They were coming towards me. As I was running, I could tell that they weren't going to give up. I didn't bother looking back. Luckily for me, I knew this place like the back of my hand. I took a route back that kind of gone down into a little canal that would give you pretty good coverage. I eventually made my way back. I went to sleep and didn't bother telling my parents because they'd never let me play out again. I then woke up to what I thought was the morning. The sun had just started rising. I went to open my blinds and I could see that there was a huge fire in the forest. Now, we got evacuated soon and our house was saved. Now, we had to move away very quickly after, and my parents never said why. That was until I got much older. Turns out that there were some crazy people who set fire to the forest. What scares the hell out of me is the fact that they knew that I was in there. They had the full intent of setting fire to the forest with a young child in there, and they had no mercy in doing so. This is one walk home that I'm never going to forget. I live out in the middle of nowhere, so it's normal for me to walk with my friends home. However, the one friend I do normally walk home with, Nil, was unavailable at the time. He was off school because he was sick. That meant I had to walk all the way home by myself. I didn't mind doing so. I find walking in nature very calming. I decided to take the shortcut path this time because, well, what's the point of taking the longer route? It's cool if you've got a friend to talk to, but if you're on your own, what's the point? Now as I'm walking home and it just began getting dark, I had the feeling that I was being followed. I just couldn't shake this feeling off of me. I made it back home and didn't really think anything of it, but I just couldn't shake the feeling of being so paranoid. I did eventually manage to shake the feeling and get off to sleep that night. So the next morning, I went into school and my friend was there nil. I was really happy because it meant that I'd have a good day at school and I could walk home with him. So the school finishes and we walk home. We decided to go the short way again because it was getting dark soon. Now as I'm walking, I see my friend's mum. She lives down the path a little way from me. She waved me over. She said, hey, why didn't you two stop yesterday? 
I had some milk and cookies for you waiting in my home. I said, oh, sorry, I never even saw you. I wanted to get back in quick. She would often give us treats and she's just a really nice lady. But then she said, yeah, I'm sure your friend saw me. And why was Neil messing around? I then looked at Neil. I said to her that Neil wasn't with me yesterday. She then said that, yeah, I saw you and Neil walking home yesterday. He was just behind you. I thought he was playing some game with you. All these years later, thinking of that moment sends shivers down my spine, reliving the moment that I've realized somebody was following me home and I was completely oblivious to it.